Welcome back. Now in this section of the course, we're going to move on to the Amazon Virtual Private Cloud or VPCs for short. VPCs allow you to build secure, isolated private networks in the cloud within which you can deploy resources such as compute, storage and database services to host your applications in a secure and isolated manner. You can decide what sort of traffic you will allow into your applications and from what sources, what sort of firewall rules you can configure and ensure that your application is only accessible to those who actually need access to it. In this section of the course, we're going to deep dive into how to create VPCs in the cloud and how you should design and structure them and how you should build them for resilience and security. Now, before we actually delve deep into VPCs, it's important that you actually understand some core basic networking concepts to help you build your VPCs in accordance with best practices. If you're relatively new to IT or have little networking experience, then I strongly recommend that you review the next set of videos to help you design, architect and build your VPCs to ensure security, reliability and performance for your workloads. Let's get started. And so let me introduce you to IT networks. Now, an IT network can belong to a large corporate data center where you have massive amounts of devices and different components that all need to communicate with each other, or it can be a small home network supporting a startup business. The fact is that an IT network will consist of two or more devices connected to each other over a wired or wireless link to enable the sharing of resources such as data and applications and hardware such as printers and photocopiers. On the screen, we've got multiple devices. We've got laptops, desktops, printers, photocopiers, and even servers hosting backend applications that need to be shared across those devices. Connecting up these devices with each other, either through a wired connection, such as an ethernet connection, or a Wi-Fi service provided by a Wi-Fi router will enable the sharing of those resources with each other. With a network, you could, for instance, share a single printer across multiple devices. And this, therefore, also saves on cost rather than having to attach a printer to every single laptop or desktop. Likewise, you may only need a few servers to host backend applications, and those applications can be shared by your various computers and tablets that may need access to that application. Now, an IT network essentially therefore provides an isolated environment to share the resources between nodes. Nodes is just another word for the devices that you're looking at on the screen. And depending on how you build your IT network, you can define communication speed, performance and reliability. So when it comes to things like communication speed, the type of Wi-Fi router you use, or perhaps the versioning of the Ethernet services and cabling that you install, is going to determine the type of communication speed you have in your network. In addition to that, you can also define both inbound and outbound access into and out of the network using both physical connectivity and firewall solutions. So if I wanted to add a new laptop to this network, I can either attach it to the Wi-Fi router or set up an Ethernet connection for wired connectivity services. In addition to that, using firewall solutions, I can restrict access into the network and ensure that my network is secure. The next thing we need to look at is how these devices, these desktops, laptops, servers, printers, and photocopiers actually communicate with each other. And that's where I'd like to introduce you to the concept of IP addressing. And IP addressing is a critical element in enabling these devices to talk to each other. And understanding how IP addressing works will help you design, architect, and build your virtual private cloud on the AWS platform. So let's look at IP addressing next. On the screen, we have a corporate data center which has an internal network, what we call a local area network or a LAN for short. Now, each device in that network will have installed within it a network interface card. Network cards or network interface cards are designed to allow the communication to actually take place. So every device on that network will either have one or more network interface cards installed. And these devices can be assigned with one or more IP addresses that allows that communication to take place. Every device on that network will also have a unique IP address. An IP address basically stands for internet protocol address. And each device on that network is assigned a unique IP address before it can participate in a network. An IP address is essentially a unique string of characters that identifies the computer it is associated with to the network. And no two devices can have the same IP address in a given network. And this is fundamentally an important aspect 
of a network architecture. So an example of an IP address is like 192.168.1.5, which is the IP address of that desktop computer over there. This is in fact what we call an IPv4 address, a version 4 address. These addresses and this particular versioning of IP addressing has existed for a number of years now. But there are some issues with this address and we'll come on to that in a second. Nevertheless, the important aspect here is that each and every device in a given network will have a unique IP address and it is by means of that IP addressing that communication can take place. If this desktop computer wants to access an application on server A, it needs to ultimately know the IP address of server A in order to send that request to access that application. Now you might be wondering exactly how these devices get their IP addresses. It's all very well me saying that you installed a network card and the network card is then assigned with an IP address, but how does that actually happen? Let's take a look at that next. Okay, so let's take a look at how these devices actually get their IP addresses. Now there are really two ways to do it. You can either physically log on to each and every computer or laptop or server and statically assign the IP address using a network application of some sort that configures the network card installed in that device. Okay, so this involves literally logging onto the machine, bringing up the network configuration application and providing the necessary information such as the IP address and some additional IP related information like subnet mask and default gateway, which we'll talk about later in this course. But it basically then means that you have to go around each and every computer and manually configure those computers with this IP information. The alternative is to introduce something called a dynamic host configuration protocol server or a DHCP server. You can add a DHCP server to a network and then you just need to ensure that your devices have been configured to automatically be assigned an IP address from a DHCP server and suddenly all of that management overhead, all of that heavy lifting is taken away from you. Let's take a look at how a DHCP server actually works. A DHCP server dynamically assigns an IP address to a device or node on a network to enable communications using IP. Devices and nodes that accept an IP address from a DHCP server are called DHCP clients, which is why you need to configure them to automatically be assigned an IP address from a DHCP server. And so there's that client server relationship going on here. DHCP servers are configured with a pool of IP addresses from which they can then lease out IPs to those clients. So when you install a DHCP server, there is some configuration that needs to happen so that you tell the DHCP server what's the pool of IP address that it can use to assign clients with IP addresses. As well as IP information, the DHCP server can also assign other TCP IP configuration information, such as details of DNS servers to connect to or gateway addresses through which they can send network traffic outside of the boundary of that local area network. But more on that a little later in the course. Now let's take a look at how a DHCP server actually works. So you've introduced a DHCP server, you've configured it to provide all the necessary IP information to any client that needs an IP address and related TCP IP information. The process is a four way handshake. So it starts with step one, which is called the DHCP discover process. Clients on the network send out broadcast messages to discover one or more DHCP servers and request an IP address. In step two, the DHCP server makes an offer. So DHCP server will send out an offer packet to the client on a broadcast address with all the IP address information that the client might need to participate on the network. In step three, the client makes a request for the suggested IP address, if you will, and broadcasts that request saying that, okay, it would like to be assigned that IP address. And then finally, in step four, the DHCP server goes through an acknowledgement process where it resends that IP information to the client and the client basically performs all of the necessary IP configuration on its network card so that it can then participate on the network. Now, I've just gone through this over a very high level approach. If you are interested and really keen on understanding the exact nitty gritty about how DHCP servers work, you can take a look at that link which will provide more additional information. Okay, so I know I'm sending you to a Microsoft web page in an AWS course, but you know, the fact is that if you wanna be a successful cloud engineer, then you have gotta start thinking multi-cloud. So in addition to 
local area networks, you can also design and build wide area networks. Many companies have multiple branch offices spread across the globe, and perhaps you need to connect these offices to each other in order to allow centralized communication and sharing of resources across those offices for your business. Wide Area Networks allows this sort of connectivity and is also something you may wish to consider when you're building virtual private clouds on the AWS platform because it is possible to create virtual private clouds in different regions and have them talk to each other. And again, that's something we'll take a look at as we progress through this course. So in addition to being able to have local area networks and wide area networks, you ultimately can also connect one network with another network. Each network has a boundary. So in this local area network that we're looking at on the screen, there is a specific boundary. Now, if you want to send data and network traffic from within this network into another network, such as the public network, for example, the internet, then you have to cross the network boundary. And essentially this involves installing and configuring something called an internet router or a gateway. And once you've installed an internet router or a gateway and you wish to connect to the public network, such as the internet, you can configure that router or internet gateway to be able to communicate with an internet service provider. Now the internet service provider will then issue something called a public IP address, one or more public IP addresses that you can then assign to your gateway router device. And essentially, if you look at the actual internet router stroke gateway, it's a device that will at the very minimum have two network interfaces, an internal interface, an internal network card, which will have an IP address that's within the same range as your network range and an external IP address, which is more than likely going to be a public IP address. Now I'll come on to the differences between private versus public IP addresses shortly. But for now, what I would like you to understand is that in order to cross your network boundary and enter a different network, such as the public network, you need such a gateway device. And network gateways are devices that allow you to connect networks by performing translation between different protocols and data formats at the network boundary. Gateways serve as entry exit points for all data that passes through before being routed to its final destination through the most efficient path. And so ultimately what you would need to do is configure your network with such a gateway or such an internet router that allows you to then communicate with external networks, in this case, the public network, such as the internet. So hopefully now you understand a very high level overview about how you can create different types of networks. One of the fundamental aspects of building your network, and indeed when you come on to build VPCs on the AWS platform, is understanding how IP addresses work, how they are formatted, and how they're configured. This is extremely critical in allowing you to define your network boundaries, but also in allowing to ensure communication between your devices across the resources that you deploy in the cloud and even on premise. Now, when it comes to IP addresses, there are actually two versions of IP addresses. There's the IPv4 address, which is a 32-bit address and has been around for decades. And then there's the IPv6 address, which is in fact a 128-bit address. And this is relatively new in the world of IT. Now, there are certain limitations with IPv4, which is why IPv6 was invented. But even till this day, IPv4 is widely used in order to support legacy systems and the public internet in general. And so let's dive a little deeper into IP addressing. So when it comes to IPv4 addressing, it follows a specific format. An IPv4 address actually comprises of four decimal numbers separated by full stops. Each of those numbers is called an octet. And each of those numbers has a range between 0 to 255 in decimal. This is an important aspect of an IPv4 address that you need to try and understand. You may be wondering why does it go up only to 255 in decimal? Why not 999, for example? And the reason for that is because each of those octets can hold a maximum of 8 bits in binary. And so when you convert a decimal number into binary of eight bits, the maximum range that you can have is eight zeros all the way up to eight ones. Eight zeros is the same as a zero in decimal and eight ones 
is the same as 255 in decimal. Now we have an entire section that explains how this conversion takes place. And I urge you to review those videos as well. But for now, I'd like you to just appreciate the fact that within an IPv4 addressing scheme, the maximum range of an octet is zero to 255 in decimals or eight zeros to eight ones in binary. And so let's take that one step further. So you've got your IPv4 address in decimal, which comprises of the four octets. And if we convert that into binary, you've got 32 bits of ones and zeros, where X represents here either a one or a zero, and it's a total of 32 bit address that represents your IP address. Now it's important to understand that every device that you plug into this network or the internet for that matter, needs to have a unique 32-bit IPv4 address if you are using an IPv4 configuration. Interestingly, what that also means is that the maximum number of IP addresses you can have in an IPv4 configuration is 2 to the power of 32 or 4 billion odd IP addresses. Now that may seem like a lot, but actually we've run out of IP addresses. With the IPv4 addressing scheme that started off decades ago, we're actually in a problem situation where we've literally run out of IPv4 addresses. And yet IPv4 address is being used till this day because of compatibility with legacy systems, because of the fact that there are a number of systems and number of applications and services on the worldwide internet that simply function on IPv4 addresses. Now ISPs and you know different bodies across the globe are migrating across to IPv6 and a lot of the newer technologies, whether they're IoT devices or the wonderful Google Glass that came out some years ago, perhaps would function on an IPv6. However, we still use IPv4 mainstream today. And a number of devices and a number of services actually use a combination of both IPv4 and IPv6. And furthermore, all of your cloud providers, such as AWS, Microsoft, and Google, are actually able to use IPv6 as well. But we still need to look at how we can handle the fact that IPv4 addresses are very, very scarce. Let's take a look at that next. Now, as discussed, we have a problem with IPv4 addressing. It is only a 32-bit address, and there are only 4 billion odd unique IP addresses. The fact remains that IPv4 is still widely used and supports legacy systems. So how did we solve the problem of only 4 billion odd addresses? Because we still continue to use IPv4, even though IPv6 is available. Well, that's where it gets interesting. And that's where I would like to introduce you to the concept of private IP addresses versus public IP addresses. Before we actually look at that though, I want you to consider the fact that in a corporate network, whether it's a small home office or a big, large multinational, the fact is that not every device needs to have a unique address that's accessible from the internet. You certainly don't need your desktops and laptops, tablets, printers, and photocopiers being accessible from the internet. This is for your organization. This is internal to your network. You're going to share those photocopies and printers amongst your colleagues, but you certainly don't want someone from the outside World Wide Web being able to print stuff on your photocopier. So as a result of that, the beautiful IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, came up with a brilliant idea to reserve certain IP address ranges for private use. And they reserved the following three sets of IP ranges and have defined them into three separate classes. So you've got the class A address, which is the 10.0.0.0 all the way up to 10.255.255.255. And that is reserved for private IP addressing. The addresses in that range are not routable on the internet. That range gives you 16 million odd IP addresses. Then we have a range of 16 class B blocks, the 172.16.0.0, all the way up to 172.31.255.255. And that gives you over a million IP addresses. And then finally, we've got 256 class C blocks, the 192.168.0.0, all the way up to the 192.168.255.255, each block giving you 65,000 odd IP addresses. There's another range that's actually also reserved, which is the 169.254.0.0, .0 .0, 
all the way up to 169.254.255.255, which is actually reserved by Microsoft for their internal networks. So if you've got a small home office and you've got all Microsoft operating systems, you can actually use that range if you wanted to. Most organizations tend to use the class A, class B or class C ranges for internal networks, but it is possible to also use the Microsoft reserved IP range. That said, the question still arises, how does this resolve the scarcity of the IPv4 address issue? And the answer to that is that because the IANA has actually reserved a set of ranges for private use that are non-routable over the internet, any company across the globe can use those ranges for their internal networks. And because those companies need not have their internal devices accessible from the internet, all companies across the globe can use the same set of ranges. So you've got company A using a 10 dot range over here, but company B is using the exact same range for their internal network as is company C. And that's fine because these devices and these IP addresses are not routable on the internet anyway. And regardless, we don't want these devices to be accessible from the internet either. And so these companies and their devices need not have any of those scarce public ranges being assigned to their devices. We can roll out and provide those public IP addresses only where they're most needed and only to devices that need to be routable over the internet, such as internet routers, gateways, network address translation services, and more. Now, when it comes to these devices actually being able to connect to the internet, that's quite simple as well. You need to basically install and set up something called a gateway for your network boundary. And as we explained in the last part of this video, a gateway allows you to basically send traffic from one network boundary into another network boundary. And when you set up a gateway, you then can establish connectivity with an internet service provider that operates out on the internet. That internet service provider will issue you one of those scarce public IP addresses for your network router modem stroke gateway okay and obviously you can purchase additional public ip addresses if your organization needs it but the fact of the matter is is that in this company which may have hundreds and even thousands of internal devices we probably just need the single public ip address in order to allow it to connect to the internet so just coming back to the gateway technology, it's got an internal network card that has an internal IP address to allow communication from internal devices. It's got an external public IP address that gives the connectivity to the internet. And ultimately, its job is to transfer data and network traffic packets from the internal network out to the internet based on the requests that are made from those internal devices. This type of technology and this relaying element is what's known as a network address translation service. So a NAT service is designed to help you translate internal network traffic out to external network boundaries. And so let's talk a little bit more about NAT. So network address translation is a method of remapping one IP address space into another by modifying network address information in the IP header of the packets whilst they are in transit across a routing device. NAT enables you to map multiple internal devices' private IP addresses to a single public IP address, and this is known as one-to-many NATing. The fact of the matter is you can hopefully see how your internal network and all of the devices in the internal network can now access the internet through that NAT device through a single public IP address. NAT devices can offer security by ensuring that inbound initiated access from the internet is prevented or only allowed on certain ports. And so using this port mapping service, you can, for instance, allow inbound traffic from the internet on port 80 to connect to your internal web server. By restricting the types of traffic you allow inbound, you ensure security and you ensure that you monitor and manage what types of traffic from the internet is allowed to enter your network. And so what I would like to do next is introduce you to the concept of port numbers, as if IP addressing wasn't complex enough. Port numbers is basically a means of distributing your IP packets to the relevant service or application on your server. And the best way to describe port numbers is to use a telephone switchboard analogy. So here we have a wonderful receptionist who is accepting inbound calls and then redirecting those calls to the appropriate parties within her organization. 
So for instance, there may be an inbound call that she needs to redirect to Max in the finance department, to Bob in the sales department, or to James in the IT department. Now, in order for our receptionist to redirect those calls, she's going to make use of extension numbers. And you can think of extension numbers as port numbers in the world of IP. So a port number is a way to identify a specific process or an application to which a network message or packet is to be forwarded to when it arrives at a server. Port numbers can operate on both TCP and UDP, Transmission Control Protocol and User Datagram Protocol. Port numbers are 16-bit integers that are added to the header and appended to the message being transmitted so that when it arrives at the server, the server knows what to do with that message. Examples of port numbers include port 80, okay, which is used for standard HTTP traffic when you're hosting a web server. These days, however, we really want to be hosting HTTPS or port 443. Another one is RDP. So if you use a Windows server and you want to remotely connect to it using the Windows desktop remote client, then you'd be using port 3389. If you're interested in learning more about TCP and UDP, feel free to check out that link that I've shown on the screen below. It's also available in the description box or in the resources section of this video. So just taking a look at this visually, let's say that you've got two companies, company A and company B, and we've got our servers in each of those companies. And in company A, we've got Alice, who has a desktop machine and in company B, we've got Jason who has a desktop machine as well. Now let's say Alice wants to send an email to Jason. Alice's company has a server on the 192.168.5.6 IP address and she sends an email through this server using her email client, possibly Microsoft Outlook, for example. When the message gets to the server, the server redirects it to the email service or the email application. It could be Microsoft Exchange as an example. And the email service then processes that message and sends it out of the server to the other server that is the destination server for that message and specifically identifying port number 25 as the port number for that message. Okay, So the server that receives the message knows what to do with it. It sends it to the email service on company B's server. And then again, company B's server will process that message and realize that it is for an internal member of staff called Jason and redirect the message to Jason's Outlook. And Jason gets an email in his inbox. And so ultimately, pretty much this is how port numbers are used to help you ensure that messages and data that is transferred from one device to another is sent to the right service or application that needs that particular message or piece of data. Using port numbers, we are able to host multiple different applications on a single server and support those applications. And data that is sent to those servers are able to redirect that piece of data to the appropriate application or service. So next, I'd like to move on to port number ranges and well-known ports. So port numbers between 0 and 1023 are what are called well-known ports. These have been allocated to services by the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, the IANA, for common applications such as web service, which normally use port 80, and SMTP service, which use port 25 on the Internet. Then we have a range of 1024 all the way up to 49151. These are registered ports and these can be registered for services with the IANA and should be treated as semi-reserved. So for example, Microsoft has reserved port 3389 for the RDP service, the Remote Desktop Protocol service. Ports number 49152 all the way up to 65,525. Now these can be used by client programs and you are free to use them in your client applications. Also, when web browsers connect to web servers, the browser will generally allocate itself a port in this range. These are also known as ephemeral ports. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this video. And I hope you really enjoyed our introduction to IP addresses and port numbers as part of our AWS Fundamentals course. Watch out for more videos that will be coming where we deep dive further into IP addressing and subnet masks and then swiftly move into VPCs in this playlist. If you enjoyed this video, I request you to leave a like and a thumbs up. And if possible, please do subscribe to the channel. Thank you.